Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, my name is Giselle Ruthier. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at the Health by Housing Lab at NYU School of Medicine. I will be joined by three amazing colleagues shortly for a moderated discussion um, that titled Experts by Experience, Uplifting and Integrating the Knowledge of People with Lived Experience of Homelessness in Social Care Research, Education and Practice. Um, so as with all the panels that have comprised the SIREN conference, we will be abiding by the agreements for a safe and great meeting. So folks could take a moment to just read these briefly. Um, and while you're reading, I know other people may have seen these multiple times, but um, while you're reading, I'll just note that before we get into our moderated discussion um, uh, and our, before our panelists introduce themselves, I'm going to go over a few brief slides on homelessness, racism, and health to center our conversation. So this is probably not new information for much of our audience, uh, but is certainly worth reinforcing and introducing to those who may not be familiar that housing is a fundamental social determinant of health. Uh, and in particular, the lack of housing has been linked with a wide array of detrimental health outcomes, um, including higher rates of hospitalization and emergency department use, higher rates of chronic disease, worse overall physical and mental health, higher rates of reported exposure to physical and sexual violence, and early aging and mortality. So as an example of the latter point, a recent study that just came out by Rebecca Brown, uh, Margaret Kushel, and colleagues, um, and that included 450 older homeless adults found that age adjusted mortality rates over a four year period were over three times higher for homeless men and more than five times higher for homeless women than their counterparts in the general population. And the most common causes of death among older homeless adults in this study were heart disease, cancer and drug overdose. So with our focus today on racial health equity in social care, it's important to reflect on the role of racism in creating and perpetuating homelessness. So we can start with some statistics. Um, on any given night, there are more than 580,000 people experiencing homelessness in the United States. Many more experience homelessness over the course of a year, and the numbers grow even larger if you include people living doubled up or in other unstable conditions um, in the definition of homelessness. And as you can see in the slide, um, Although Black people comprise about 13% of the general population in the United States, uh, they account for more than 40% of the homeless population. And these inequities are structural in nature and have occurred, in fact, by design of very specific policies over the history of the United States. Um, similarly to doc how Dr. Boyd in our opening plenary session described the healthcare system producing disparities by design. Um, we could spend a lot of time going over the many examples, um, but there's been a lot of great work written about this, and I encourage audience members to seek out and read more about housing policy and race in America for more detailed information. Uh, a few books that I put here, Race for Profit and The Color of Law, are some examples. But briefly, um, some examples include who gets access to a mortgage and on what terms are issues that have been determined by housing policy over many decades in the United States. Um, even both before and even after the Fair Housing Act, uh, Black people have explicitly been denied mortgages or offer, offered subpar terms, and this has had compounding implications for housing access and wealth building over time. And it's not just about home ownership either. Exclusionary policies and real estate practices have also made accessing and maintaining rental housing more expensive and difficult for Black renters. So current housing market trends like home prices, rental vacancy rates, development and gentrification are all influenced and shaped by housing policy, both historical and current. Uh, these very same housing policies that have excluded Black Americans from housing for centuries. So um, we know actually today that housing market conditions are the strongest known predictors of homelessness in any given community, um, as opposed to any individual level characteristics. Um, and so these housing market conditions, which are um, influenced by housing policy, are, are what produce the, the disparities in homelessness that we see today. So as population health researchers, we have a role in promoting racial health equity. That's why we're all here today. Um, I really love this quote by Dr. Marcela Nunez-Smith, um, who's an MD and a public health scholar at Yale School of Medicine. Um, she said, we all must work together to disrupt the predictable patterns of who's harmed first and harmed worst. Um, so this can and should include linking scholarship with policy and advocacy work and broader public education. Um, so this 
that I've included um, a figure here by Catherine Lifehite and colleagues in a recent article they wrote about building health equity through housing policies. But it really kind of um, just um, shows um, how structural forces impact community level and household and individual level health, um, health outcomes. Um, and so the notion of uh, disrupting these predictable patterns involves changing systems and structures um, in order to influence health outcomes at the individual and household level. So just briefly, a little bit about who we are um, and who you're going to hear from today. Um, all the members, all the folks that you're going to hear from today are from the Health by Housing Lab here at NYU School of Medicine. We conduct research, provide, um, provide education and inform policy. And uh, you'll see here our core values listed out um, that are part of the work that we do in our lab. And we can put those in the chat a little bit later if you want to read them. Um, these are the folks that you're going to hear from, and I won't spend too much time on that uh, slide, but just again, briefly to engage, we were primarily going to be using the chat function periodically through the course of our discussion. I will um, uh, put some questions in the chat. You can also put your questions for our panelists in the chat, um, and as much as possible, we'll try to have um, a bit of a dialogue here. So I'm going to stop sharing for now. Um, and get into our discussion and ask our panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so why don't we start with Kadisha? Could you just give a quick introduction? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Khadija Davis. I'm a person with lived experience. I work with Health by Housing. I also did the summer consultant um, job this summer. And also I work with different avenues. I do a podcast called Hear Our Voices. And I work with Family Homeless Coalition. So I do a lot, try to do my best to work with my community to make it better. So that's who I am. Thanks, thanks Kidisha. Uh, Antoine, can you introduce yourself? Great. So my name is Antoine Lavelle. I'm also a person with the experience, um, having uh, been a homeless youth in New York City with my mother. Um, I'm currently a provost doctoral scholar at the University of Pennsylvania. School of Policy and Practice. I've also been a Chief Operating Officer of a peer-led organization. So policy, practice, experience, as well as lived experience. Amazing. And um, Kelly, could you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Glad to be here today. I'm Kelly Doran. I'm an emergency physician. I work at one of our public safety net hospitals in New York City. Uh, and I'm also a faculty member at NYU School of Medicine. I currently direct the Health by Housing Lab. Great. So why don't we get started with, a, you know, a real basic intro question. Um, and I'm going to put it in the chat as well if folks want to share any thoughts that they have. But this is open to, to all of you, Kadisha, Kelly, Antoine, uh, jump in on what is the importance of incorporating people with lived experience of homelessness in social care research? Khadija, I'll let you go. All right, no problem here. So um, I feel like the best thing is to have a personal experience because a lot of times people who don't have experience, they feel like they know everything. They feel like because they can see it from the outside that it is what it is. But when you actually live what's going on, you know how it is to go through an HRA line or go to PATH, which is where um, families go in New York City for um, shelter. So I feel like having a person who actually been on the ground instead of just looking at papers or numbers, it really makes a difference on how a project can go and how successful it can be if you have people who actually know about it, who actually lived it. Um, and I think it makes a difference in how things end up coming out in the future. Yeah, and to piggyback off of that, that research has shown that you know, people with lived experience uh, know more about uh, social problems that they've gone through, right? So we know that a top-down approach does not work. <laughs> it is a bottom-up approach that works. And it's also, it it's a paradigm shift, right? Where we have people who are white, non-Hispanic, actually creating policies for people who have been racialized as black and brown. So really we need to make those changes and allow people who have gone through these challenges to start to make policies because we know that they'll work. We're currently going through a homeless crisis throughout the country and we're putting a lot of money, directing a lot of money to homelessness, but we are seeing we're not changing the outcomes. 
it's because we're not opening the door, allowing people with lived experiences in. But that also goes to the perception of black and brown, their intellect, right? Their education level, when we know that they know most. I always say that when I work with young adults, I let them make the decisions. When I work with students, they make the decisions, they make the policies, because I know that they know what they need more so than anything. So rather than having research studies, let's just ask populations, what do you need more than anything? So I think that's why it's important. That's great. Um, and Kelly, feel free to, to add more on that, but also um, could you talk a little bit about the formation of the Health by Housing Lab and its structure? Sure, and um, yeah, 100% agree with everything that Antoine and Kadisha said. And that's actually why, you know, when we formed the Health by Housing Lab just a year and a half ago, this is a, a new, relatively new venture. We went into it knowing uh, that we wanted to, that we needed to uh, emphasize and prioritize the voices of people with lived experience. So uh, the first thing we did was to form an advisory committee. A third of the members of the advisory committee are people with actual lived experience of homelessness, most of them with, with recent or current lived experience. And the advisory committee really like sets, sets our agenda in terms of what types of topics are we covering in the educational events that we're doing, uh, who are we inviting as speakers, uh, what are we focusing on, um, and that was really important to us. And I think Giselle showed the slide with our value statements and I put them in the chat too. But even just thinking about that, one of the first things we did was to sit together and spend some time putting together these value statements and having people at the table who have that lived experience really got us someplace different, I think, than we would have been with these value statements had we not had people with lived experience contributing. So just for example, one of the value statements is healthcare, housing, and homeless services systems should do no harm. And that really came out of um, what the folks with lived experience were expressing, which was that they had been harmed by these systems and that this was a really important value for the, for the lab to have. And I don't think that we would have gotten there had we not been you know, really engaging with, with people with lived experience and listening to them in this. Um, and we were really gratified to hear recently, you know, we just had an advisory committee meeting our, our eighth, you know, we're relatively new. And we asked people like what they, uh, what they thought about how things were going. And, and folks said that in contrast to some other groups they've been on, they really felt like everybody's voices were valued equally. Um, and that's really important to us. Uh, but I would note, you know, one thing in terms of just founding and starting the lab, this type of work is, is different from the norms in academia, I think. Um, I think we all know um, that a lot of times in academia, it's like, go, 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 publications, grants. Uh, you know, one of the tenets of white supremacy culture is this forced sense of urgency. And so when we started to the lab, I actually said, you know, to our department chair, like, look, we're gonna do things differently. This is gonna be slow work. Um, that's really important. It's gonna be different. And thankfully we had that support, but you're still kind of pushing up against this like normative way of doing things in, in academia. Um, and the only last thing I'll just say just about forming the lab is, so, you know, we're giving this panel, but there are definitely areas where, where we're still growing. So, you know, for example, you, you all see I'm the director of this lab, I'm a white woman, and I do not have lived experience of homelessness. Um, and ultimately we're aspiring to get to a place where, you know, not only do we have staff, like, you know, Kadisha worked this summer as a consultant um, for the lab, but where we have leadership reflecting uh, people with lived experience too. And also just another piece is that it, it also allows people to talk about the tests that they've had gone through and the testimony that they have, right? Because a lot of times we keep talking about the social problem, but there's so many testimonies out there, right? Khadija, she has a testimony. Right, I have a testimony, right? Because there was a multiple tests that we've gone through, and those tests and those testimonies can be used as future models, right? And that's what we need to do is change the models that we use moving forward. Because the previous models, they really don't work. They are very much right embedded white supremacy, but now these models have to change and these shifts have to occur by having leadership like Khadija. I always say that I should not be a leader, right? Right? Because I have multiple layers of privilege. All right, and I haven't been homeless in years. So it's people who have recent experience who should be leading organizations and having resources given to them so that they can do this very important work. 
Thank you both. I mean, I think this is so important too when we, you know, we keep sort of talking about lived experience and the importance of incorporating that, but there's a lot of diversity in lived experience. And so um, Antoine, for you, I directed at you a bit, how, how can we, um, how can social care and public health researchers incorporate the diversity of lived experience, um, particularly among people with lived experience of homelessness, you know, acknowledging that no two people may have the same experience, right? And so how do we, how do we think about that? So obviously that language has power. Um, I do not call myself an expert because I am not an expert. Right? Homelessness is someone's lived experience. It's not political science. It is not sociology. It's a lived experience. So I'm an advocate who can understand the people that he serves, right? So I really, that's who I am. Um, and also to understand the diversity within the homeless populations is important. For me to call myself an expert, I am ignoring the lived experience of a youth who was evicted because of a sexual orientation. I'm ignoring a woman of color who is homeless because of discrimination in the labor market. I'm ignoring a woman who is uh, homeless because of intimate partner violence. Violence. I'm also ignoring someone with serious mental illness. So I'm not an ex uh, expert in any of those areas, but I can use my experiences right, and resources to ensure that they have a voice in the room and not just the voice, right? Because we can't just stop with just having a voice, but it's always the, what are we doing next, right? So it's so much more than that. So it's understanding the diversity within homelessness, understanding poverty as the overarching poverty and discrimination is the overarching issue and then moving from there. Yeah, absolutely. And this is sort of great going into my next question for Kadisha. And, you know, in terms of um, uh, voice versus real, you know, sort of meaningful partnership, what do you think researchers can do to ensure that people with lived experience of homelessness are included in social care research, not just in one project or in one panel, but in the long term? I think first they need to find those people who have the experience, who is um, okay, open with actually speaking about it because a lot of people have the experience and they don't actually want to talk about it. Not everybody's going to be like me or Antoine, you know, who will come out here and say, yes, I was homeless. Maybe I lived on the street. Maybe I was abused to get in the shelter. People, as he said, has a lot of um, different ways how they got there. I think they need to hire people who are okay with sharing their experience but also um, keep people on, if it, they start from the beginning, you can't drop them off in the middle of a project. You should keep them all the way to the end of the project so they can see how far it went and how successful it would actually be. And I think that's the best way to keep them, keep them in. Doing a survey at the beginning and say, oh, what do you think is best? And just taking their ideas and just leaving them after it goes to the next step is like, what's the point of asking my opinion if I can't even see where it's going, you know? Um, it's like going on a train and starting and only going, you wanna see at the end, but you only stop in the middle of the, the whole thing. So it's better, I feel like, to have a person there to represent throughout the whole thing. And not just one person who's street homeless, because they're going to have a different idea than a mother who comes in with a child. Um, I probably wouldn't survive being a street homeless person, but I give I give them kudos because they, they 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 stay out there a long time and they do they have to do to survive. But a person is not going to know how it is to have a child in the shelter and going back and forth to bring them to daycare and bring them to work if we never lived that experience. I'm not going to understand how it is to be a youth because I wasn't, in that age group, they have a certain particular age group that they have um, in there and they, and they alone come with their own set of issues. So I feel like they have a diverse group of people from beginning to end. I think they'll be more successful in um, reaching a lot of more people and to really understand how to do it for different people in different areas. Yeah, and I would say that I'm so happy, you know, I, I'm a social worker. Um, I didn't choose social work, social work chose me. And I'm so happy that it did because it's what gives me my passion and purpose every day. Um, it's what motivates me is to make changes for homeless population, right? To bring awareness, but not just awareness, but to do this very important work. Um, so I'm glad that it picked me because it's not about me at this point. It's really about future generations and the ability to give them hope and not just hope, but to remove barriers so that they can progress. Um, so it's we're all in it together, and we have to understand that there are a number of institutions, we have a number of areas in the economy that present barriers for populations that we have to begin to do the work in. Um, so it can't just be healthcare providers, but it has to be economists, it has to be, you know, housing providers, right? It's so much more than just 
understanding homelessness, but it's also about doing the work after. I'm sorry to interrupt, not to interrupt, yeah. but um, I so agree with that. I feel like sometimes we just think about it's always, or just not having the money, because a lot of people who are homeless, especially in the shelters, have jobs. It's not always about just one thing. Everything intersects into one thing, and it kind of, um, it's like a building block. You could, you have to start from the beginning and to get to the top, and if you don't have all the materials to do it, then it's not going to be successful, and if you don't build it on proper ground, it's also not going to be safe. It'll just crumble down, so if we put everything together and look at every direction everything is coming from, coming from and put it together into the right places where it belongs for the, the foundation to be strong, I think that's when we'll have a better society, and homeless, the homeless issue hopefully one day could be, you know, eradicated to be honest because it makes no sense I feel like we have so much great minds out here and we have the money I feel like people say we don't have the funding I feel like when they they make funding when they feel like they want to make funding we can see that in corona what just happened you know the past two and a half years if we really wanted to do it and put our minds together not work against each other but we all have technically the same goal I think it'll be a much better world and a better New York if we're just gonna put it for here but yeah yeah and even just looking at the pay disparities among women of color it's very much connected to the amount of sleep that they can get, right? We know that if you get less sleep, it's more likely you'll have cardiovascular issues. So then we know that poor health is also connected to the economy, right? So we have to understand the nature of even transportation, right, in its connection to poor health. <laughs> you just can't look at one area. We have to really understand all pieces and how they intersect. Amazing. And, and you know, and you mentioned this, um, there's an impact of sleep and, you know, there's, we can list a whole host of other health outcomes that um, be, might be impacted and exacerbated by experiencing homelessness. So one thing that, that we have a, as a lab has done is we've, um, uh, we have this event called Flipping the Script. And so I'm wondering, Kadisha, if you could tell us a little bit more about what that event is um, and, and what the purpose, purpose of the event is. Flipping the script is it's very unique, honestly. They have a moderator um, who's usually a healthcare provider, um, like healthcare worker, and they usually have people who are on the panel who have lived experience. They we usually come up as a as a group with a topic that we think would be prevalent to what's going on now, or just something that we all have. Um, you know, feel like it'll be good to suit us. We, as as I said before, we come as a you know advers advisory group and we come up with ideas like that, and the person basically asks questions based on what the topic is and the people with the experience tell people about what they actually went through and how they basically represent a certain population usually of people also and that's how that recipient script kind of goes it's a very unique I think way of looking at it and it shows you how um healthcare because these are like healthcare you know issues healthcare and housing does affect people and how their lives are in the system while they're in it and even after, you'd be surprised how you can go, honestly, people go in a shelter, not with the health problem. When they're in the shelter, they come out with depression, anxiety, because it's, to be there alone is stressful. So you get to see how it kind of evolve and how they are after and how it can still affect their lives, even when they're out. Absolutely. Um, and, so, and we're talking, you know, more broadly today as part of this conference about racial health equity. Um, uh, but it's also important to think about intersectionality, right? And I'm wondering, Antoine, if you can speak a bit more to incorporating intersectionality in our work um, and among people with lived experience who are um, in engaged in social care research. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, when you think about the LGBTQI population, um, thinking about trans women of color, right, we know that the average age you know, of death for trans women of color is about 35 years old, right? How can we support that population, right? We also know that their deaths uh, are increasing among that population. Um, how do we ensure that people who are participating in survival sex actually have health care um, and not stigmatize them as they seek treatment, right? Because we all live together, right? We can't think of ourselves as individuals, but as a community. So we have to really understand that. I also think about it in terms of being a black man and know that right? Black men live the least amount of years in the United States. And understanding how racism or, and um, gender, right, intersects um, and causing these disparities among Black men, that's a problem. So I always think about me as an individual, but also other communities, but I understand how racism 
uh, even prevents black men from seeking care, right? The unemployment rate for black men is very high because of systemic racism. A majority of individuals in the United States receive their health care from their employer. So you're, if you're disconnected from the labor market, it's not likely that you'll be able, able to access health care, right? Then even if you have access to health care, then you're stigmatized or not heard by providers. So there are a number of issues that we have to think about. It can't be just one, as said before, but huh, just that I always go back to the economy, the labor market, the labor market, the labor market, right? In terms of accessing healthcare, housing, right, childcare, all of those pieces that are very important to keep people housed. Can I just call it, there's one thing in the chat that touches on kind of those systemic, there's really structural factors as the root causes for homelessness. So um, in the chat, one of the comments is trying to understand how someone becomes unhoused is not the foundation. I was homeless and working full-time with benefits, et cetera, but priced out by having one income source that could not compete with the gentrification economics. Um, and I know that's something we think about in the lab a lot. I mean, this is the, the root causes, as Giselle mentioned, are, are these structural factors um, and just always coming back to that, even though we talk about individuals, but just always returning to the, those structural drivers. Yeah. You know, in New York City, neoliberalism is an issue, right? We're putting a lot of money into homeless organizations. Um, and most homeless organizations, they're, they are led by white individuals. Um, uh, we're putting millions, if not billions of dollars into homeless prevention, homeless outreach, but yet we, we keep getting the same outcomes. Right, that goes back to political economy, right? Where politicians receive a lot of money, right? From different groups to maintain the status quo. The status quo does not benefit marginalized populations. So when do we actually organize to ensure that elected officials are doing the right thing by these populations that may not vote for them? Because poverty will prevent people from even going to the polls to vote. Absolutely. Um, and I want to also continue to encourage the audience to share. Um, I did put one question in the chat. Um, if anyone wants to share about ways they've engaged folks with lived experience of homelessness or any sort of barriers they may have encountered in doing so, please continue to add to that conversation. Um, you know, I also want to talk about, um, you know, as we've, we're, we're all here now on Zoom, and you know, talking about access to technology as maybe a potential barrier to engaging folks um, you know, in addition to, you know, some of the being um, connected to networks, being connected to service providers, having a way to connect with someone who is actually doing care, so, um, social care research. So I'm wondering, Kelly, if you could speak a bit to the importance of access to technology, um, social capital, compensation in incorporating people with experience in, in, in social care research. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's really important. And um, I think it's really the difference between going from like this lip service of, oh, like we want to include people that have experienced homelessness or oh, we invited people with lived experience of homelessness to um, to actually making it happen and um, ideally happen fairly. Um, and I think, you know, it's also an important question because I think sometimes there, you know, just speaking broadly, I think sometimes people are like almost afraid or like they don't think they're going to be able to work with with people with current or recent lived experience of homelessness. I think sometimes in the field we see, you know, agencies or organizations or academics reaching to people with maybe more distant experience and not trying to 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 work with people with the more recent experience. And as Antoine mentioned, you know, it's really important to get all of the perspectives. Um, so a couple of things like to get into the nuts and bolts of it that we do in the lab. First of all, we, we pay people uh, for their time and their contributions. That is just, you know, a critical foundation. So we pay people uh, for participating in advisor committee meetings. We pay people for serving in a panel at our seminars. We pay people equally, regardless of where they're coming in terms of what they're contributing or their expertise. You know, we're not paying our academic panelists more than we're paying our uh, lived experience panelists. Um, and I, I think that's really important, but it's still amazing how infrequently this seems to happen across across the board. But in the lab, we're, we're pretty um, strict about it. And then it's, just, it's really just being thoughtful about some of the practical barriers around technology. 
So for us, like especially with Zoom, we make sure that there's always a call-in number option so that people that don't have you know, a computer and Wi-Fi are able to call in on a phone. Um, and then we have the link too for when that's better and even formatting the meeting so that we, we know that somebody might call, be calling in, they can't necessarily see the chat, they can't see a Zoom poll. And so just tailoring things to make sure it's, it's accessible equally to, to everyone. We actually did give all of our uh, advisory committee members with lived experience, uh, recent lived experience an iPad uh, so that that could help to minimize some of the barriers. It's an iPad for, for them to keep and use. Uh, and we, you know, it's just, some of this is also just being thoughtful. So, you know, people who are homeless, they are not often given much agency in their lives. They're kind of told like, do this, be there, no choices. Um, and so like we let people pick like whatever iPad case they wanted. It's just like, a, you know, a, a human thing. A lot of it is just being a human thing and trying to put yourself in other people's shoes and anticipating their needs, but more importantly, listening to them about their needs and then actually doing something about it. Yeah, and I, I want to also acknowledge too, there's a few themes that have come up in the chat around trust. And so we're talking about engaging folks with the experience and um, one person said, we found at a food bank that a stepwise process of engagement worked well to engage people in research, starting out with conversations and surveys when they're in line for the food pantry, turned into attendance at classes, and then turned into them inviting to the, um, them to serve on advisory boards. Um, another person mentioned, um, several people I've encountered who are unsheltered are very private, and I have not earned their trust, rightly so. I think it would be very important as we engage through employment, research, discussions, et cetera, important to have uh, to then have access to support each person emotionally, psychologically, et cetera. Are we prepared to offer the support needed as they work through their lived experience? Um, so I think that's you know another important thing to think about. Um, does anyone have thoughts on trust? I think you know that's something that's, that has come up and seems like it might be important. I want to hear what Antoine and, and Kadisha have to say, but I guess I'll just say, you know, we do, I think just offering multiple ways for people to engage too. So, you know, we have somebody on our advisory committee who's unsheltered, who prefers not to share their name and their video all the time, and that's fine. And we can still engage and, and learn from that person. Um, and then, yeah, so people, right, in terms, I think some of this is just the time too, and recognizing that that yeah, you do kind of have to be available to support people emotionally and um, practically when they're going through tough times in their in their lives. Um, you know, if you're engaging with people who are currently and or very recently homeless too. Um, so that's just part of what makes this this kind of work different. But also understanding that them not trusting you is a part of their trauma, and you're not understanding that means that you don't understand their trauma and you're putting the onus on them to trust you. Really, when you should be doing the work, they shouldn't have to do the work, right? They've been through more than enough, right? So you're constantly engaging them and giving them a reason to trust you is really how you should approach the situation. I think people think that people are homeless, especially I think families, I can only go from where I'm coming from, that we're like unicorns. You'd be very surprised how many people at your job has been homeless before. I was working at a school at the time when I was homeless and I heard, I overheard, cause I'm very nosy. I overheard this girl talking and she said certain things. And I'm like, she's homeless. And I took her to the side. I was like, did you go to PATH? And I was asking her, she said, how did you know? I'm like, cause I, I went through PATH. So I understood the signs when she was talking. You'd be very surprised who's, who's out there, who's home, who's been homeless and is homeless right now. Cause they look very normal. And if you just treat them like people, empathize with them if they they want to talk about it. if they don't just you know Bobby they're not ready yet everybody's not going to be at the place where they're going to be open and proud to say I was homeless before it's not like we wanted to, most people didn't come in on purpose people it could be a fire you'd be very surprised it could be um domestic violence it could be a lot of things why people ended up in this situation just um take your time don't be pushy <laughs> I would say and don't be a person who feel like they're going to judge them based like on what their situation was because um homelessness does not everything about that person. They have everything else they can offer you, not just being homeless. They, they could be a person who's have a cure for cancer. You just don't know because you're just so worried about them being homeless all the time. It's not, it's not the only thing you can talk about. We are people just like everybody else. And we just we want to be understood. And we want to also, most of us 
who are in this advocacy work want to help to make a difference and um, other people who are coming behind us lives. Do we know how it is to be homeless? And also, we know that, you know, being homeless is traumatic and that trauma is stored in the frontal lobe and it can be accessed at any time. And just your very appearance may traumatize or re-traumatize people. So understanding that you may be right, seen as um, representative of, you know, trauma, racism that someone has gone through. So you have to be able to acknowledge that and say that I may be the person that's causing this trauma, right? I'm the cause of that, right? So that the person will engage me, a bottom approach. They'll engage me when they're ready. And they may never be ready, but that's okay because they get to make those choices in their lives because it's their life. Absolutely. And sort of on this, sort of on the flip side of building trust is, um, is exploitation and thinking about as a researcher, as someone um, who may not have lived experience of homelessness and wants to engage people with lived experience, how can researchers and practitioners work to prevent exploitation and tokenization of people with lived experience for their own aims, right? Because maybe this is something that would be part of a grant requirement or they wanna make sure that their research is being um, promoted in certain ways. Um, and so this is really a question for all, all of the panelists. Um, any reflections on how how to prevent exploitation in some of the re relationships that um, you may be seeking to develop? I feel like one thing they should be doing, I feel like everybody who works with people who are homeless or formerly homeless, um, first of all, you're paying the people who are working with you because I found, well, the first thing has happened to me, but I found people talking about it, especially in this community, because there's a very small amount of people who do want to talk about it. You'd be very surprised. And sometimes they do work and they're not getting paid for it. And it's kind of weird that you're making us do all this work and time and energy into a project and the people are not getting paid for a job that they're doing. Um, I feel like also they should have more, multiple just in, it should be different type of people who are, who should be homeless to kind of help out the different narratives of what's actually, you know, the people's lives out there. So I think that's one way to kind of not just only like one, one black girl. And then it's just like, it should be different Asian Hispanics um, a mixture of people, youth in this to kind of help out and take their ideas as, um, take their ideas and give them credit for it. If it's something that's going to make you push your thing forward, their name should be on it. It shouldn't be this, oh, this is a Jane's thing. And it's, and where's, where's Khadija? Where's, like, it just doesn't make sense, you know? Give them credit where credit is due because that's their um, information, that's their story. And yeah. And also we know that elected officials will use vulnerable populations such as people who are homeless to push their own political agenda. Um, and that political agenda may not be there to benefit, you know, the population that the person with a living experience really cares about. But we have to be able to call right, that out and do something about it, right? Because it's you shouldn't be pushing an agenda that's not going to benefit the entire population, but rather you as an individual. Because we know that power, privilege, and all those pieces, it's it's unfortunately um, something that everybody wants and they'll do anything to get it. And we have to push back against that. So understand how, pol how policies are made by using people who are usually vulnerable. I think the same is, is true, you know, thinking about academ academics and academia too. Um, you know, I know, so one of the kind of ground rules of this of this meeting and something is totally true is that impact is more important than intention. But I, you know, when it comes to this, I think it's also important to examine intentions and, and think about, you know, motivations. And so, and to be really self-reflective about that. So if you're in academia and, and you know, you're thinking about your goals and I mean, I've actually heard, you know, you hear things, right? So, you know, you sometimes hear people say something like, oh, well, you know, I'm working with this, you know, highly marginalized population because it's easy to get funded. I mean, <laughs> Lord, like if that ever passes your mind, like you shouldn't be doing um, this, this type of work. So, that, you know, this is a, an instance where I think intention is important. There is a question in the chat related to this, how do research funding rules uh, research institutions incentivize exploitation of research participants uh, with lived experience and how can those incentives be changed to discourage exploitation? That's a really tricky one because it does also go back to this like push, push, push to, to get things done quickly. And um, uh, I don't, does anybody have a great answer to that question? 
how to how to actually cha change the game, not just the response to it, to, to change the systems. You know, it's frustrating because like we've seen even so, so I mean, to call out, I guess the National Institutes of Health, they've done some great things recently where there's been new, uh, some like great new interest in funding um, applications related to health disparities and to community work, but it'll be something like the RFA goes out and then a month later, the due date you know, is the due date, which obviously doesn't give you enough time to do real like genuine engagement. Um, and so I think just speaking out and continuing to kind of push on well, you know, the way that you did this, this re request for proposals really uh, is just kind of making it more likely that the that kind of high, like ivory tower research institutes are gonna be the ones that are gonna be able to turn this around super quickly. And just reinforcing white supremacy. I mean, why possibly can't you only extend it to historically black colleges and universities? Right, that's something you could do. Right, we have to be per we we have to be intentional about how we eradicate white supremacy. Right, we have to be intentional how we incorporate people with lived experiences into policy and practice. Like those things are very important, and that's the the only way to do it is to create mechanisms that allow access for marginalized populations. Those are all great points, and I think um, you know part of the. The discussion around this particular question is something that um, needs to continue to be explored, right? It's not something that we're going to come into. I wish we had the answers to that question, and that's something that I think um, discussions like this and conferences like this and um, meaningful research will hopefully be able to push a needle forward on this. Um, so I'm going to encourage audience members as we are nearing kind of the end of our panel. If you have any questions, final questions or thoughts, please put them in the chat. Um, and in particular, based on, we'd love to hear based on what you have heard from today, um, how can you see the information um, being incorporated into your own work? Um, have you, what have you taken away from our conversation today? We'd love to hear that. Um, and to turn it over to our panelists also to, to kind of wrap up and reflect, um, what do you all think um, researchers in public health and social care research and related fields could how can they use the information and, and the topics that we talked about today in their practice moving forward? I will just use a quote from Maya Angelou, when you know better, you can do better, paraphrasing it, right? So the start is knowing better, so the next step is doing better, right? Hopefully you can use this information to do better and how do you take this information and then operationalize it into policies and practices are our next step. I feel like they can um, add more people with different lived experiences to their on um, their board to kind of help them push them along to um, a better direction. And I feel like it could make a big difference because if you don't have a person who's there who understands the system in a way, because there's one way the system has a way of saying, oh, this is how it should go. But usually it's not how it exactly goes when you go through it, you realize there's nothing like what they're saying. So I feel like adding a person in and people should be in who experience should be in policies to make differences and in, in funding to help make differences in other people's lives who coming up after them. So I think that would be a way to get um, things a little bit better for people of who's homeless or unhoused as they say now. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. And thank you for both sharing in the chat, um, talking about inviting researchers to live a day in the life of someone who's experiencing being in house and how to navigate the services. Um, thank you for everyone for sharing their input here. We have pretty much reached the end of our moderated discussion. Um, and um, you know, maybe now with a few minutes left for people to switch on over to the 3 p.m. Um, reflection timeline. Um, so I want to thank everyone for listening to us and to joining our session. Um, it's been um, really wonderful to hear from all of you.